Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing great today. I love the fact that we have the opportunity to release an episode that was previously on Crawl Space on the Missing feed because it does feature a missing individual. This was an episode that we released on Super Bowl Sunday with Mr. John Lorden, and we all brought a different Super Bowl related story to the table. And it was so good that we feel like it needs to be out there again because John's first story does have a call to action. It does, yeah. We speak about the disappearance of Abby Flynn from Gloucester, Massachusetts on February 2nd of 2020. And this is a real mystery. Um, She really seems like she disappeared into thin air um, in this kind of small neighborhood of Gloucester. Um, And John expertly takes us through the case. So if anyone's got any information, please submit that to the Gloucester Police Department. You can call 978-283-1212. Okay, so I hope you enjoy this episode. And if you want to get any episodes of Missing ad-free, you can now subscribe to Missing Premium right there in the Apple Podcasts app. It's $4.99 a month. You get ad-free episodes, you get early releases, and our weekly bonus show. And if you're not an Apple user, you can go to missing.supportingcast.fm and sign up for the same product there. And Tim, what about social media? If folks wanted to see us do, say, a live Instagram broadcast or TikTok, where would they go? They can follow us on social media at Missing CSM. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. We're going to break quick for commercial here, and we'll be right back with John Lorden of Brain Scratch. Welcome back to the podcast, John Lorden of Lorden Arts. How the heck are you today? Doing great. Always happy to be joining you guys. Uh, looking forward to what we can dig up in terms of Super Bowl mysteries. Tell us about this first story, John. Absolutely. This is one that I have covered a few years ago. It's it's a pretty recent missing persons case. It was February 2nd, 2020, and 59-year-old Mary Abby Flynn, who goes by Abby. She was getting ready to have a Super Bowl party. Now that year we had the Kansas City Chiefs and they were going to be playing the 49ers. She was having several friends come over for the big game. She had just made some cookies. She left those out on the counter and she had made some pizza dough. She had left it while it was still rising. The thought was apparently she was going to go for a walk and leave it rise and then come back and get ready and finish up preparation for the party. Her friends started showing up for the party and Abby was nowhere to be seen. So this is taking place in Gloucester, which is, I believe, in your neck of the woods. Sure is, right on the seacoast. Are you familiar with the area? Are you guys close to it? Very close. Okay, okay, that might help in in terms of understanding this, because you know I'm looking at maps and trying to get my head around it. It's a very rocky shore, very rocky ocean front. And that's definitely a concern with with a case like this. So it's in Essex County. Population was over 28,000 as of the 2010 U.S. Census. It's an important center in terms of the fishing industry, and it's also a popular summer destination. Abby lives in a nice part of this neighborhood called St. Louis Avenue. According to NamUs, uh, Abby stands between five foot five inches tall to about five foot seven. She weighs somewhere from 190 to 210 pounds. Brown hair, shoulder length, eye color is listed as brown. No distinctive physical features noted, and no description for clothing or accessories. But as her family kind of learns that she's missing, they start trying to determine what those items might be. So we actually wind up getting a couple of different explanations. Some sources would say that she was likely wearing a red jacket. Other media sources are saying, no, she was wearing a navy blue L.L. Bean puffer jacket with L.L. Bean boots, blue jeans, and possibly a flannel shirt. The sources note that Abby was last seen having a FaceTime with her son at approximately 2.40 in the afternoon on that day, and she actually had told her son that she was gonna go for a walk in her neighborhood. But we know she goes missing from here, and a big question kind of throughout this that even the police chief keeps bringing up is, do we know if she actually got out for the walk or could something have happened in the home and she was taken from there? Some, something along those lines, because there's really no confirmation. She's never spotted outside on the walk. The police chief noted that it seemed like she left her house 
and she left the front door unlocked. And when law enforcement got on the scene, they checked it all out. They didn't see any signs of a struggle that happened within the house. Probably not an intruder type situation, or if it was, it was something very quick. They didn't leave any signs behind. Now, most of the articles written on this case lean very strongly on the fact that when she went for a walk, while we know that that was her intent based on her conversation with her son, there is just no confirmation that she actually does. Like, And, and we're talking about a neighborhood where They've probably got some cameras on these homes. There's a church that's just down the road. There's some opportunities that, you know, surveillance video should have picked her up somewhere. We do get one little hit on that as we roll forward. Basically, she's got all her friends coming over. A Super Bowl coverage starts around 6 p.m. on the East Coast. And we know she's talking to her son at 2.40. Some reports say that her friends actually start arriving for the party as early as 4.30. And then other reports are saying, nah, she went for her walk at 4 and then her friends started showing up at 6. But either way, we've got that gap of, of a few hours in there. And her friends show up, front door's unlocked, they walk in, cookies are on the counter, pizza dough sitting there, but no sign of, of Abby. Just wanted to note the temperature that day seems in the 30s. Yeah. In February, you know, I'm definitely not going out for too many leisurely walks unless uh, my dog has to do her business. Was there any dog walk or anything like that? Your instincts are very good. There was a dog. However, she didn't take it with her. I believe it's a pug and she actually leaves it inside. We'll get a little explanation that might help you understand in terms of why she would have gone for this type of walk. But I know you guys cover a lot of missing persons cases. When I ever start looking at one of these, I'm checking a map, and the first thing I'm looking for is water sources all over the place. And as you guys noted about knowing this area, we've got a lot of water sources in this area. We've got Niles Pond nearby, Niles Beach, Brace Cove, and Brace Cove is reportedly a place that she was known to walk to. Pretty short walk from her home, maybe five to ten minutes. Gloucester Police Chief Ed Conley was talking about the initial searches and saying that they were focusing on hiking trails that are nearby that she was known to frequent. They had approximately 80 police personnel that come out, start doing their search. They get assistance from aircraft with uh, thermal imaging, which I think is really smart. And especially when you're talking about temperature conditions like that, could be very helpful. U.S. Coast Guard is assisting. It really becomes an all hands on deck type of call. Keep in mind, and this is something that just really moves me. This is something that's happening on Super Bowl Sunday. The, these are everyday heroes for us rising to the occasion on a day where a lot of them probably want to hang out with their family and do their kind of stuff. They get out there and they start this big search for Abby. And pretty close to immediately, another thing that's a little different with this case is they realize that she's missing so quickly and the search effort is just like immediately launched. So this isn't like one of those cases where, you know, it takes someone two or three days police report gets in, then they start their searches. Like they're out there that day looking for her. And it seems like a very intensive search goes on for that first one or two days. The chief noted it was very cold out there during the search, particularly on the first day. As you guys said, somewhere in the 30s to 40s during this time, according to weather data. So she probably was likely wearing one of those jackets, either a red one or the blue LL being puffered. But this information keeps kind of changing and morphing because her family is essentially coming to the house and going through her things and trying to figure out what's missing that she could be wearing. Could be that's why the red jacket kind of falls off. The later explanations seem to be with the blue LL bean puffer. One of the questions that sprung to my mind, especially with all the, the true crime that we review, is she married and where's her husband? She does have a husband, but he is back at another home that they own in Houston, Texas. They basically split their time between two homes. They have three children, all of them are adults, one lives in New York, and two are away at college. Abby herself is a retired nurse. She grew up in Gloucester and, like I said, divides her time between there and Houston. And her husband, Rich, actually still works in Houston as a radiologist, that's why he's there. By all accounts, they have a wonderful life, they're happy. Her brother, Brian Flynn, told Dateline, quote, it doesn't make sense that she would just walk away he said she's the most caring and selfless mother, friend, and sister. He would also share that she enjoys homemade macaroons, croissants, bagels, and ice cream. I saw several comments online talking about how she really loved to show her friends and family how much she loved them through cooking and food. That was even kind of part of this Super Bowl party. Like she was getting the pizza dough ready, but it was so that everyone could come over and then everyone was going to make their own pizza as, as things were going on. So someone that 
truly saw the, the kitchen as kind of the center of her social experience. So her brother had said that the family had been attached to Gloucester since 1963, and it's no accident that she bought that house. That house actually overlooks Brace Cove. And he said that they always knew that this area had amazing people, but after Abby went missing, it became much more clear to him because of all the care and support that he was getting from people in the area. We've got this whole community helping out, local media coverage going. Police Chief Ed Conley even reaches out to a local Facebook show called Good Morning Gloucester and does an in-depth interview taking all the open questions that come his way. And it's like a 50-minute interview, and it's like everything's on the board, man. He is just an open book. It's it's a very unique watch. I really haven't seen a lot of police chiefs go about it that way. It's usually very kind of controlled. Certain things they'll talk about, certain things they won't. I really love the approach because he's open to all possibilities. Even though they didn't see that there was any signs of breaking and entering, he's still very open to the possibility, well, she could have been taken from the home because we, we don't have any confirmation of her being anywhere else after that. Sure doesn't sound like a voluntary disappearance. No. She's expecting guests. I mean, if it's a voluntary disappearance, that would be going about it in not a great way because the search was launched immediately based on the planning that you had, you, the guests you had coming over. And the things that we're hearing about, they're just lining right up with what we know about her personality and, you know, she's made cookies for everyone. She's got more food that's being prepped. Uh, she left her dog at home. All these pieces, you're right. There doesn't seem to be any intent that she actually took off on her own. So her family pretty much keeps away from the media except for her brother, Brian. Her kids aren't commenting. Husband isn't really commenting. I, saw, I don't think I saw any quotes from her husband or her kids anywhere. It was really only her brother. Brian that's been speaking. He talks about how Abby is a very normal person. She likes weaving baskets, knitting, dyeing wool, photography, particularly wildlife, and cooking and baking. One of her neighbors actually talks about this as well. Was there some possibility that she might have been taking some pictures of wildlife? Could there have been an accident of some kind? while she was out doing that. But her family says that her two main cameras that she used were back at home, but the police chief points out he's not certain if she didn't have a third camera, like a pocket shot camera or something like that that she might have taken with her. They're looking, they're not finding anything. They really don't find any signs of her during searches at all. She lives in a neighborhood street that's surrounded by a lot of foliage, and there's a lot of these different paths that she was known to take that kind of just cut off through the woods and lead to different outlooks and, and different rocks. They do check local surveillance cameras and they come up with one possibility. They've got footage of someone walking, but the person's so far away, they're not sure. They have to hand it off to experts and the experts come back basically saying they do not think that it's a match for Abby. We do have a lot of nice homes in this area, so I think that there's probably a good chance that we've got some security systems that might include cameras, but a lot of these homes are way back away from the street. They've got these really long driveways. You might have your gate actually have a camera on it. It's an interesting challenge. That front door is nowhere near the street. But she did tell her son that she was going for a walk. Yeah, basically tells her son, I'm going for a walk. Or I'm just getting ready for the party. Everyone's coming over. Yeah, all that information. Did she take her cell phone? Was there a ping or anything? Police Chief Edward Connolly said her cell phone was located inside her home after she was reported missing. For some reason, she did not take the cell phone on the walk with her. Being an avid photographer, and you said that her two main cameras were still at home, my thought was like, okay, well, if she's going to be taking pictures, if that wasn't her plan, but she saw something, maybe she would be taking it with her cell phone, but she didn't even have her cell phone. How did she tell her son that she was going for a walk? It was FaceTime. But from home. Because I, I can see, like, if you're expecting people to come over and you've been prepping all of this stuff during the day, maybe you want to go out and get a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Reset yourself before the people come over. I could totally see something like that. But beyond a walk that's a certain distance without your cell phone just doesn't feel right. Oh, I, I get it. I know that some people want to go out and be on their own and maybe they just want to get away and, and detach from their devices. I go through that. I, you'd be surprised how much my phone is on Do Not Disturb. But I do think it's really important to just kind of remind everyone about this. And who knows, maybe she thought she was going out for a 10 minute walk. Maybe this is one a, a terrible situation where there was a slip and she wound up in, in water or, or something terrible like that. I think it's just really important to remind everyone, just take your phone with you. It's just, it's too important of a tool. If she had a medical event or something, I mean, we're, we're talking someone in their 50s, like these are concerns 
that I think all of us should have as, as we're aging as well. Chief Connolly would speak to the press again about the case. Basically, this time he's concerned about a lot of the same things that we are. You know, did she slip somewhere? Did she wind up in the water? He's still open to, did someone come into the home? He keeps reaffirming they don't have confirmation of her being on the walk she was supposed to take. He does note that they really don't have a problem with home invasions in this particular area. So he'd be extremely surprised if that's what's going on there. He did say that they got a lot of tips about one or more unknown white vans that were seen in the area. And they were working to kind of track those down, figure out what they are. I mean, they might have been services, you know, someone come in to repair a heater or something. Nothing is is really helping them find Abby. And of course, we have people that start talking and the information starts getting messy a little bit. Her neighbor, Roger Ward, said that he thought the oven was left on. And this kind of became a big point of contention in the Facebook interview that I mentioned with the police chief. Person after person asking, like, was, was the oven on? Was the oven on? And the chief had to, like, break it down, like, super clear for them. No, the oven was not on. He did say there was cookies on the counter. There was the pizza dough. I don't know why it would have been such a big thing that people are getting caught up on. Was the oven left on? Unless they were trying to think of her intent in terms of leaving. Was there anyone else at home with Abby at the time when she left? I know she was on a FaceTime with her son, but was there anybody at all? Just the dog. No, no one else reported. That's another thing with the dog. If you do want to go for a walk before your company comes, you have your dog right there. Like that's just an obvious thing to go do. Even if your dog doesn't need to go for a walk. I haven't had a dog since I've moved to this cold weather area that I'm in right now. I just don't know, is it practical to take a pug out in 30 degrees? I just, yeah. I don't know. Is it is it okay? Is yeah. it, it's not harmful to them or anything? It's interesting as well when you mention that the area doesn't really have a problem with home invasions and things like that. It's pretty isolated as far as like towns in the area. It's on Cape Ann. Actually, it's a pretty beautiful like scenic road to get to Gloucester, but there's no reason why you'd be passing through Gloucester if you weren't going to Gloucester. So if it was something like that, it would have to be something like extremely targeted. Well, especially on Super Bowl Sunday, if you're planning a home invasion and right. you're planning it in Gloucester, I mean, you're already making yourself like stand out. Most people are probably having friends over. So yeah. you're invading homes that will probably have guests on, unless people are thinking a lot of those homes are going to be empty. Perfect time to go rob the place. But in that case, yeah, I mean... You said it. You'd have to know. You'd have to have the knowledge of, oh, that person's not going to be at that particular residence on that day. I didn't see anything about her plans changing. And, you know, this is a party. So there had to be some type of planning at least a day or two at a minimum in advance of letting her friends know, hey, come on over. That coupled with her telling her son that she's going for a walk would be an incredible coincidence. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's it seems like it's it's too much. Her neighbor did mention something else that could complicate the search a little bit. If she did happen to have the, a, like a pocket shot camera, like the chief was thinking might be a possibility. Being a wildlife photographer, he said that she would sometimes hide in spots in the woods to get photographs of coyotes and other animals. But if you've left your first two cameras at home, your phone would probably be like your test camera if you're walking around looking for a spot. Like you're probably not gonna bring your third string camera out there, hide in the bush when you're supposed to be home in like 10 or 20 minutes anyway. It just doesn't sound logical to me. I think the neighbor is just, you know, he's just trying to figure it out based on what he knows about her. And most often he sees her as her leaving the house to go, do something like that. Uh, I know sometimes, especially in situations where people might be like, if there was a medical event and she was freezing and she started going into hypothermia, I know that some people will sometimes burrow or try to keep warm by effectively hiding themselves in some way. They'll kind of burrow under a bunch of stuff to try to keep themselves warm. It makes it more difficult for searchers. A little bit of a, of a consideration there. Uh, on February 11th, several articles detailed that the search for the 59-year-old mother was called off days after her disappearance. But then a few days after that, state police resumed the search. There was little pockets of news about like, they're looking in this particular wooded area. This one, they scoured for several more days, Brace Cove, Niles Beach, working on both sides of her home. They used sonar searches to search under the water, but still didn't find any trace of her. And of course, when you have a big community like this, some theories start popping up and the police were trying to knock down some of those theories as they were coming up. People... Uh, hypothesized about coyotes, the suspicious vehicles I mentioned, and made connections to other missing persons 
cases. This kind of thing always drives me crazy. I don't know about you guys, but it's like people seem to, to want to connect the case to another one. It's almost like we're looking for a serial killer constantly. Like, oh, these three people went missing. It means something's happening in this area. There, there's got to be someone that's doing this. There was this other case with another woman who had gone missing a few years before, and her name kind of kept being brought up in this. Chief Conley responds to that. There is no indication, zero at all, none that this is connected in any way to any other cases or that foul play was involved. If I thought there was some sort of danger to the public, I would err on the side of releasing that information rather than keep it. And then he makes a great point about the types of theories that he's trying to fend off. I think a lot of people who review true crime, we sometimes slip into with law enforcement ourselves. And that's well, if you can't tell me what happened, then like prove the negative of it, you know, like prove that a home invasion didn't happen. And he said, they're coming up with ideas. They want me to prove that these things didn't happen and that's proving a negative and that's impossible to do. I think it's a great point. I mean, how can you prove that no one came into her house with a gun and said, you're coming with me and that there was no signs of a struggle because they just got her to walk out, they closed the door behind them and that's that. And you can actually take that concept further and say, you know, prove to me that she didn't have an accident or that she wasn't attacked by some wild animal. Like, it's just, I, I know that as humans, we're constantly looking for explanations because they kind of ease us in terms of the things we're grappling with about realities like this, you know, to kind of put that expectation on someone else to hey, appease me by proving that this thing isn't true. Initially, there was a bunch of media on this case. And then literally within a few weeks, like the media just almost completely dries up. I went looking for more updates on this because I it's been two years since I originally covered this. There was only one article posted on the first anniversary where Chief Conley says that they found nothing significant in the case. He's been contacted by psychics, None of that info is panning out. NamUs is showing no exclusions for testing against unidentified bodies. So they're not even finding bodies in the area and you know, being able to test them as possibly being her. She has literally just disappeared. Now the uh, Gloucester Police Department continues to lead the investigation. If you happen to have some information on this case, you can reach them at 978-283-1212. Also Massachusetts State Police are involved with it as well. Their number is 978-745-8908 and they have a case number attached to it, which is 2020-106-0056. And I just wanna thank uh, the Gloucester Times, who did a bunch of great coverage on this, Mass Live, Boston Globe, Boston 25 News, the New York Post, and Wikipedia for information that was in this. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors, back to the program from one incredible physical mystery to a different disappearance. This one, I guess, is a little bit more psychological. It is definitely centered around football. Barrett Robbins played football for the Oakland Raiders. He was actually voted as an All-Pro in 2002. They made it to the Super Bowl in early 2003 to play against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and big football fans might remember this game as the Gruden Bowl because John Gruden had coached the Raiders the season before, but now he was head coach of the Buccaneers. The Raiders made it to the Super Bowl, and Robbins 6'3", 325 pounds as the starting center for the Oakland Raiders. A little bit about football. Center is a very important position on the field because they touch the ball first. They actually snap it to the quarterback and they do a lot of the important blocking and calling out of assignments, pickups for blocks so their quarterback doesn't get hit. Again, Barrett wasn't just good at his job. He was the best in the league that season. He was first team all pro, which meant he was literally the best at his position that season. He was the Patrick Mahomes of centers that season. But after a team meeting on Friday, he went out to dinner with his family. He did not arrive at the team meeting on Saturday morning and they couldn't find him anywhere. Coaches called his wife who was in town and she didn't know where he was. And an executive from the Raiders called local law enforcement at that time about his disappearance. He clearly wasn't in his hotel and they were concerned for his life. The truth was Barrett was actually having a manic episode and was wandering the streets of Tijuana, Mexico. And Barrett was bipolar, is bipolar, and had never been diagnosed and had been self-medicating with alcohol and drugs. And he later said that he was so disoriented while he was in Tijuana that he thought he was celebrating the Raiders' Super Bowl victory. 
And of course, wow. the game hadn't hadn't even happened yet. Does your head immediately go to injuries sustained while he's played football his his whole life? It's definitely something I thought about. We covered the case of Cullen Finnerty, who was a superstar college quarterback who was a running quarterback and took a lot of hits. He didn't have a mental illness that was diagnosed, but he was believed to have been suffering from CTE. So that might be a bit of a factor here with Barrett Robbins. Again, as the center, he snaps the ball. He he gets hit in the head literally every play. That's like 50, 60, 70 plays uh, a week. And that's just in the games, not even in practice, that, that he's getting hit in the head. So possibly they did diagnose him with bipolar disorder after this event. And he was on uh, medication for a period of time. He was not allowed to play in the game. He did return before kickoff. Coach Bill Callahan actually banished him to the hotel that the players, friends, and family were staying at, though. Hmm. The team was very upset with him. And he stayed with his wife and kids on Sunday morning, the Super Bowl Sunday. His wife asked him if there was somewhere he was supposed to be and he replied church with a question mark wasn't really aware that the game was being played at the time the Raiders lost the game 48 to 21 you'd have to imagine in big part to not having their all pro center I wonder if if what you were talking about like just the impacts that he's taken and stuff could have exacerbated issues that he was having with with bipolar disorder but it sounds like he just went into a mania and his view of reality went upside down on him i mean to think that you're celebrating the success of that game already that it was already done that's really really serious thing did the staff and the coach who's the coach bill callahan did they know that he had said that, that they had won the Super Bowl? No, I don't think that came out until later. I don't think they were really listening to excuses at the time. He had actually done this before, two years earlier, before a playoff game versus the Ravens. And this had previously gone unreported. He was missing for about 24 hours and then returned and was allowed to play in the game, which is probably why the Ravens didn't release that information because that would maybe display some favoritism on the coach's part towards this player. A lot of the players were very upset after the game i guess you would say his friend on the offensive line frank middleman said if barrett robbins comes back next season i won't he said i want to play with people i can rely on we're a family when crunch time comes and one of your family members doesn't come through it hurts so they were suffering themselves the team after losing the game and not feeling like they had full support from their family Yeah, I mean, him being there, I mean, it sounds like it could have made the difference, right? Yeah, it's possible. And so he did say that he started feeling a little bit different on Wednesday leading up to the Super Bowl. One thing we know about bipolar and doing this research and and covering missing people is sometimes pressure will um, exacerbate those symptoms. And apparently during the team meeting on Friday... They installed a slightly different game plan that was going to rely a little bit more heavy on pass blocking. And and so that essentially changed a big part of the offensive game plan. Apparently, they were going to be relying more on Barrett's blocking. That could have put some added pressure on him. Although Raiders receiver Tim Brown actually said that he did not believe that that was part of why he went missing for whatever that's worth. Yeah. How would you know? Like you, you would have no idea. I mean, just the pressure of him having to learn a bunch of plays last minute or something like that could have done it. Yeah. He probably wouldn't know. And I don't think they added plays, but they changed the game plan, I think. So they installed a slightly different game plan that wasn't discussed up until that point, really. So yeah, Tim Brown said a lot of guys thought what Barrett did was unforgivable, but as the years pass, you come to realize realized that he had serious issues, that not everything was under his control. Everyone knew Barrett was unstable even then, but I think now everyone has a much better understanding of the things he was dealing with. It's definitely a well-remembered Super Bowl now a little bit because of Barrett's disappearance. I mean, this is definitely one of the stories that come up when you talk about that Super Bowl. Where does it go from here, Tim? What happens with this guy? He did spend about a month in a rehab facility, came out. He was okay for a while. He never played football again. Robbins was 29 when he was diagnosed with bipolar. And from the mayoclinic.org, bipolar disorder can occur at any age. Typically, it's diagnosed in the teenage years or early 20s and symptoms can vary from person to person may vary over time as well what that tells me is that barrett was undiagnosed and just self-medicating for probably a decade i feel uh, compassion for this uh, individual who um you know skipped out on on the biggest day of his life uh, without really being in a state where he apparently even realized it yeah yeah and, and outside of that having to deal with that on his own i mean that's just 
you know, there's there's resources, there's things that could be done, there's medication, there's therapy, there's all these options. And you would think someone like a football player has access to resources that most of us would never be able to touch and still just not have the pieces of the puzzle to put it together and say, oh, wow, like this is what I'm experiencing. I need help with this and let me get a team together on that. Is there any indication that he had said this in the past to the medical staff? That he had complained about mental illness or, or said he was worried about his stability? Yeah, or like headaches or, you know, just maybe questioning a game plan that would involve increasing the amounts of hits or if he did do that. There's still problems today with the NFL not listening to players explaining an issue because they have to be on the field. So sure. talking about something that long ago yeah, probably was never documented. No, it was not reported, at least in any of the uh, the research that I found uh, looking into this story. That diagnosis can take a long, long time. I mean, it's unfortunate that it's not something like a like a blood glucose test or something, you know, a little pinprick, and we can tell if you, if you're dealing with that or not. Like, there's people that struggle with bipolar disorder for a long time before they ever know that they have it. And I'd love to uh, tie this story up with a with a very happy ending, but that isn't exactly what happened. Barrett Robbins has gone on to have some legal problems afterwards. And uh, he actually punched a security guard um, in San Francisco at a hotel. And then in Miami in January of 2005, Robbins was actually shot three times during a brawl with police. And uh, he was subsequently charged with attempted murder for his role. Um, So he was okay with his injuries and he actually served time. And there's some some more drug charges and some disappearances and reappearances uh, as well. His former teammate, Tim Brown, can't get in touch with him. Um, One of the last articles that was written about him was about how he reappeared to volunteer some of his time. Then he met a journalist there who wrote an article about him and then he went back into hiding in a sense um, where, you know, he doesn't communicate with those players at all anymore. He doesn't really give out a phone number, apparently. So he is um, really off the grid. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. I've got another missing persons story I want to share with you guys. Mm, Might have a little bit of a lighter tone here. It was 2015. Patriots were gearing up to face the Seattle Seahawks on February 1st, and people all over the country were placing their bets on who would win. In Staten Island, New York, 63-year-old widower, father, and grandfather, John Kambakakis. He lived with his two daughters and five grandchildren. He was a retired maintenance worker for Staten Island University Hospital, And you can see him in numerous pictures, smiling with his family, just seemed to be loving his life. He stands at five foot five, weighs around 200 pounds. He has salt and pepper hair, and he speaks in a Greek accent. He was described in a new segment as a loud and lovable man who dotes on his family and treats strangers like friends. But have you guys ever noticed how missing persons descriptions sometimes all start sounding same and very similar to each other? Well, we might find in this story that uh, those missing person descriptions may sometimes miss an important detail or two. John had his daily retired life routine, having coffee with friends, taking walks, going to 7-Eleven daily, buying lottery tickets. On Wednesday, January 27th, 2015, he was last seen around his neighborhood first early in the morning at his local 7-Eleven, and then later at Hinch's Diner on Fifth Avenue in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. An employee there said that he requested a booth in the back where he could watch TV and that he didn't seem bothered. He was just his normal self, but after his time in the diner, John just disappeared. His daughters file a missing persons report with NYPD the following day. Their father never missed coming home without telling them where he was. Quote, Dad, we love you. We want you to come home. We hope you're okay, one daughter told the press. Family members were getting more concerned. He had never disappeared before, and he would always call. His daughter, Christina, told ABC7 News, I'm asking if you see him and think it's him, ask him. Maybe he needs help. If not, oh well, you keep going. He might need some help somewhere. His niece said this is not like him. His kids and grandchildren were his whole world. He wouldn't just up and leave. His family was afraid that he could have been targeted and for good reason. One local described him as, quote, a crazy charismatic Greek guy who was known to always carry $10,000 on him. Does Greek really matter here? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's going to get more New York as this story goes on. but <laughs> Because you said a charismatic Greek guy. <laughs> yeah. Like, I was trying to place that. Lance, how do you think we describe you when you're not around? We say crazy, charismatic. 
Swedish guy. <laughs> Swedish guy. <laughs> Always making it rain. <laughs> right. With 10 grand on you. 10 grand in my pocket. I know it. Any given time. So searches were conducted. Flyers were put up. A Facebook page was created. And local media would start reporting about the missing man. But the news coverage would make an interesting distinction in this case. One of those important details I was talking about before, John may have been carrying a large sum of cash on him and not just his usual $10,000. You see, John Kambakakis was retired from Staten Island University Hospital, but he still ran their yearly Super Bowl pool. That day that he was strolling around, he had collected somewhere between twenty dollars to $25,000 in cash. This is a Super Bowl pool? At a hospital. Well, you know, it's one of those grid ones where... You have to buy the boxes and then the first number of the first score, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it was like, Dr. Larry, 200 bucks. <laughs> there was all these doctors on there. Yeah, he was running a big operation, 20 to 25 grand. In but he had done it for years, but this is the first year that he was retired. So as the news coverage hits, friends of his speak up about odd things that they noticed before his disappearance. Quote, he grew a big Fu Manchu. <laughs> said a local deli owner named Mario, who knew John for decades. He told him, John, you look like Lucifer. Now you got some people that are thinking he took the cash. He's home at Greece. And his daughter would say, I could never imagine that. He knows it would kill us. As the family tried tracing his cell phone, they were searching wooded areas and telling the press about the nightmare that they found themselves stuck in. Investigators kept working the case and they started telling the press, yeah, we don't think this is a foul play situation. <laughs> Basically, the people they were interviewing were telling them that it was likely due to this Super Bowl pool that he ran. I mean, he disappeared four days before the big game. Two days after the game, the New York Post even put it very plainly saying, quote, cops think he may have taken off with the dough. Ten days after he went missing, they finally get a lead. A debit card belonging to John had been used at a 7-Eleven, but not in New York. He was in Daytona, Florida. So investigators, they request footage from the 7-Eleven. They show it to John's family and there he is doing his usual routine, going to 7-Eleven in the morning. Articles would report that he actually never returned to Staten Island, but he's no longer missing. And if you're wondering about charges for the money that he stole from the pool, no formal complaints were ever filed from the participants. So what? there are no charges. So they just assumed they were going to lose the pool anyway. <laughs> well, point. I was wondering about that. I actually looked, looked it up. And as of last year, 2022... Even though online gambling is legal in New York, Super Bowl pools specifically are not. So I think most people weren't going to try to file charges for uh, an illegal activity. Oh, do you think he knew that? Uh, maybe. A lifelong friend of his named Santo would try to give further insight, telling the press, why did he disappear? Because he's a loser. So people think... That he did take the pool money, but that he didn't actually intend on stealing it. They think that he likely gambled it and lost. And then he couldn't come back to face everyone. He can't show his face here ever again, said deli owner Mario. He disgraced himself. He should go into the witness protection program. Oh, that's taking him a little too far. You know, well, hey, Lance. I mean, if, if I knew a deli <laughs> owner named Mario and his sandwiches were that good that I was coming back <laughs> for decades... Throw a rock anywhere in New York City and you'll hit a deli owner who makes great sandwiches named, yeah, Mario. named Mario. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think I would take Mario's advice, but I don't know. I would too. If Mario was telling me that, I would definitely go into the witness protection program. Uh, John's daughter, Christina, actually defended her dad saying, quote, and I'm telling you, this thing it gets more and more New York here. I almost want to put on an accent, but uh, they're talking about how he's a gambler and all that. He's a thief, question mark. They're an effing bunch of degenerate gambling a-holes. Who are they to judge him? He's my father, and I love him, and I'm happy he's okay. Unfortunately, in that same report that that quote is from, she also says that she still hadn't heard from him since he left town. Oh, well, that's sad. Yeah. Yeah. The coverage on him basically stops there. But while I was looking into this, I ran into an online obituary from 2017 named... John Kambakakis. But it's kind of got me thinking twice. Like, did he take Mario's advice? 
Or is he really resting in peace? If he is, he did finally get back to Staten Island because it looks like the funeral was there. And the, the weird thing was it wasn't even a real, like it wasn't a write-up on his life or anything like that. It was just the um, my father prayer or our father. So the only evidence that he was buried back in his hometown was through this site. Yeah, that's the only thing I saw. I didn't see any legit obituary on it. Oh, he definitely faked it then. I mean, he definitely Honestly, did. I don't know. I just don't know what to believe, man. Like this guy, like with what he tried to pull. So the daughter defended her father and then called everyone else losers. Say yeah. He says, yeah. He's a thief. That's okay. You're all gamblers and you're the losers. I, I mean, I guess she's right. You open up the newspaper and you got Santo and Mario popping off about your dad. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to fire some shots back. I like it. Yeah, you're going to bring that to for sure. Yeah, I'm with Christina on that. And I love that none of them could go for charges on it. Because I was like, what? This guy made off with 25 grand. Like, shouldn't they be pressing charges of some kind? No. See, we should blame, just blame the government for that. Because it's like, oh, no, no, it's legal to gamble. But you can't do private ones because we need to cut. <laughs> right. If that pool was done through a site, maybe, uh, you know, and the government was collecting a bit, maybe, maybe they would have filed you know, uh, complaints. Well, and you can't call it a Super Bowl pool. It would be the big game pool. <laughs> That's right. Full circle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A big thank you, uh, ABC7. Uh, thank you, New York Post. Thank you, SI Live, for information and giving me some fun doing that research today. I appreciated hearing about that story. We have just covered two that are very serious, and, and John, yours was less serious, but, you know, along the same lines of, like, criminal activity. I kind of went in a different direction with my story and I don't know why I did it. I just wanted to round this whole thing out with a little bit of a fun discussion about superstition, about sports superstition most specifically. You two remember, even if you're not a sports fan or a football fan, you remember the Buffalo Bills four consecutive Super Bowl appearances in the early 90s. They lost all four of them, right? I don't remember, but I'll, 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 I trust you. Yes. They appeared in Super Bowl 25 uh, in January of 1991, Super Bowl 26 in January of 1992, 27 and 28, both in January uh, 93 and 94, and they lost all of them. But sandwiched in the middle is this really fascinating story about Thurman Thomas, and Thurman Thomas played for the Buffalo Bills. He was a running back, and he lost his helmet before taking the field. He only had one helmet, Lance? He only had one helmet. This was the second Super Bowl that they appeared in. This was Super Bowl Twenty Six. It was in uh, Minnesota. It was at the Metrodome in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Okay. where they played the Redskins, name changed now to the Commanders. To put it into perspective of how this moment ranks... Among Buffalo sports fans, we have a site called UB Bull Run. Tim Riordan listed it as the 13th worst moment in Buffalo sports history. <laughs> Tyler Greenewalt on Yahoo Sports listed it at number four ahead of OJ Simpson. Whoa, the worst hello. Buffalo sports moments. OJ uh -oh. Simpson was number five. Oh, come on. What That that list is bunk. Well, I'm just telling you, this is how the, <laughs> the Buffalo sports fans view this. On Sportster.com, the entire staff listed this as number two. And basically what happened, after the coin toss, Washington goes out, they're on offense, real quick. Three downs, they're out. So now it's time for the Buffalo offense to take the field. Thurman Thomas goes to grab his helmet where he always leaves it, which is on the table where they have their beverages. Goes to grab it, not there. Chaos ensues. Panic ensues. It ensues to the point where usually calm coach Marv Levy screams to his equipment manager, whose name is Dave Hojanowski, Hojo, where the bleep is Thurman's helmet? Thurman has now enlisted the help of like half a dozen people to, to try to find his helmet. Unfortunately, they couldn't find it in time. And his backup had to go out and take the field. I believe the Bills go three and out as well. And it's just a terrible start to the game. It's a terrible start to yet another Super Bowl loss. So this is the second one. I believe a lot of these sports fans in Buffalo think that this is the catalyst to the next two. 
Like it was just like <laughs> it peaked here and now everything else like it'll never get better. Well, I I'm not understanding. Like, is the helmet custom fit to his head or something? Can you not use yes. another helmet? It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. It's very specific to the player. Yeah. With, with them customizing their face mask and the fit and it all. Yeah. So, and in quarterback's case, they have a speaker in there so they can actually hear the coach uh, speak to them. Wow. Uh, and most guys, they only bring one helmet to the game. There's no backups. There's no. No, apparently I mean, not in this case. Yeah, and it's not a luck not. thing. It's not like he just wouldn't go out without his lucky helmet. <laughs> it, it was definitely a luck or a superstition <laughs> thing that it was always left in the same place. And not a lot came out about this until the equipment manager, Dave Hojanowski, started to speak to the press. And he said that Thurman used to put his helmet down in the same spot before every game. It was always on the table where we would keep the drinks. It was right to the left of that behind the bench for the offense and the helmet to this day has never been found what? i'm just kidding no i'm just kidding that oh, would have been an amazing part been of the awesome. story yeah <laughs> no they did find the helmet they found it on the other bench at the defensive side of the line so if you look at the football team that's on the sidelines they're divided up into the defensive side and the offensive side and it's just theorized by this uh, Hojanowski that someone had come along picked up the helmet thought it was theirs from the defense right. went over and just set it down and yeah. and you know it was like literally at the exact opposite end of where it should have been so they finally find it and <laughs> Unfortunately, Thomas has a terrible game. So in, in Super Bowl 25, the year before, he had a monster game. He had 135 yards, touchdown. He also caught five passes for 55 yards. And his, his stats for this game were, were so poor that they don't even do much to combine with the other stats from the other three Super Bowls. For the other three Super Bowls, he only combined for 69 yards in three Super Bowls combined. So again, these superstitions start piling on. And that led me down a path of sports superstitions. I know this isn't exactly Super Bowl related or football related, but I just wanted to run through some of these superstitions that I was looking at because I just went down this rabbit hole of athletes who do certain things before they go out on the field. And I'm just going to name some of the more interesting ones. Uh, Tim, you know Nomar garcia Perez's superstition. Sure do. Uh, with his batting gloves? Yes, with his, his batting gloves. So that, <laughs> that's like the famous one. So every time Nomar garcia Perez would go up to bat, he would wave his bat in a windmill-like fashion. He would tap that on his toes, alternating between the toes. He would also adjust the Velcro in between pitches. He would adjust the Velcro on his batting gloves. He had this whole thing. But he also had this thing where he would kiss his bat. Have you heard of this one where he would kiss his bat as he was climbing out of the stairs of the dugout before getting into the on-deck circle? Ugh, gag. <laughs> yeah. So he would kiss his bat and he would lose his mind if anyone ever touched his hat. No ma. That's our no ma. I'm not gonna go through every single one of these, but these are fun. Serena Williams never changes her socks during a tournament when she played. She never changed her socks. She enjoyed the feel of a dirty sock when she played. Wow. Wow. All right. Ew. <laughs> This one made me laugh because when you look this up, we have a wildly successful NCAA men's basketball coach, Jerry Tarkanian. And the picture that comes up, Tim, you know this coach. Did you know that he had to chew on a towel during games? Yeah. Yeah, always. He had a towel hanging out of his mouth. This is the weirdest thing. <laughs> and the, the picture of him, it looks like he's, if you were to substitute the towel for like a roast beef sandwich, yeah. he could be doing the same thing. <laughs> It's the it's the strangest thing. I didn't know it was superstition. Yeah, apparently it is. Apparently it's a ritual, superstition. It almost looks like he's lost a tooth and he's just like like chewing on yes. a towel like to to plug any blood that might <laughs> <laughs> Like that like he just got a root canal before the game and the, yeah. the dentist was like, You need to staunch the blood here. But he's like, I gotta go coach. Yeah. Michael Bibby, who is a basketball player. For the heat. He used to obsessively clip his fingernails during timeouts. How often do the two of you clip your fingernails in general? <laughs> I mean, every couple weeks. I mean, yeah, as weeks. needed, though, I would just say, yeah. As needed. You see a little white <laughs> on your fingernails. You, oh, it's getting a little long. As yeah. needed. Could you imagine doing that several times in the course of, of maybe, you know, an hour and a half? 
Sounds crazy. No. And where did those clippings go? <laughs> into the front row. Into, <laughs> into, the, right? into the nacho cheese. <laughs> His nails must grow fast, man. I mean, I don't... <laughs> the last one I want to bring up, a baseball player, an outfielder for the Phillies back in the day, Richie Ashburn used to sleep with his bats. Now, I have heard of sleeping with the Stanley Cup. Uh, I had a, a friend whose father was a general manager for a team, and apparently that's a thing. Like when they have the Stanley Cup, like people will come over and they'd want to have it in the room and it would sleep with the Stanley Cup. Like I've, I've heard that, but yeah, sleeping with bats. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> An honorable mention is the Wade Boggs having to eat a full chicken before every game. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to circle that back real quick to the Thurman Thomas helmet incident. Yes. Professional athletes, as we discussed in the beginning, are tremendously talented, very gifted, and they're able to do things with their body and their minds and and simultaneously bring in a ball while they're being chased down and having the wherewithal to keep their feet down, etc. And then they attribute that, or in the case of like Nomar Garcia Pera, you know, he hits a triple, he hits a double, he knocks in some runs, and he's like, I did that thing before I went up to bat, so now I have to do that every time. Thurman Thomas, I left my helmet there. I have form well when, you know, that time I left my helmet on the table that we carry the drinks but that one time that it's not gets so into their heads that it absolutely destroys the game and again i'll reference back to how that affected the buffalo sports community they they rank at number two number four like (laughs) they think about his helmet before they think about oj simpson so there's a danger there too right I mean, I feel like the real victims of this Thurman Thomas story are the the people who placed prop bets on him to have the first carry of the game for the Bills, uh, <laughs> and, and that would have been like a <laughs> like easy money. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, their backup comes out and gets the first two carries. Whoever put the uh, the money on uh, Kenneth Davis, who was the backup, <laughs> <Yeah>. they, <laughs> they're the yeah. real winners here. I mean, for real, that would probably great odds on that. I think this whole last story was just Lance's way of trying to lock me in for doing next year's Super Bowl episode. I'm pretty sure that now that we've had this big success, we we have to keep it going. Yes, I I agree. I agree. I just want to round out this story by saying no, no surprise that they lost. They lost 37 to 24. But again, the following year, they were so affected by this. They lost 52 to 17 to the Cowboys. Ooh. Like they they didn't even show up to that game. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for uh joining us here today, John. This has been a, a great chat about Super Bowl mysteries. Any predictions for the game? Oh, I don't know. I don't track this stuff. Someone's going to throw a ball and someone's going to catch it. That's my big prediction. <laughs> <laughs>